Look, it's really exciting to see so many of you here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's one of the most important events in the Brismos calendar. Uh, my name's John Chowcraft. I'm the secretary of the British Society for Middle Eastern Studies and a professor of Middle East history and politics at LSE. We thought this would be an appropriate occasion for me to take five minutes to offer a few words about Brismos. Brismos exists to promote Middle East studies in Britain and beyond. And let me say that it has been wonderful to be part of Brismas during the last 18 months. It's been a time of exciting, our reaching and progressive change in the society. We've stabilized and strengthened the society with the incorporation of the charity, through the wonderful work and skills of our highly professional administrator, Amy Brickhill, through the reorganization of council, and the creation of subcommittees. We have new energies in the student section. We're delighted to have hired Kirsty Bennett as our conference coordinator. We're looking for ways to hold an online conference next year. We're investing significantly in an all new website to improve outreach and engagement. And we've conducted a members survey and are now uh, processing the results, which will enable us to uh, make a number of important improvements. In addition, we've taken forward in solidarity with our Palestinian colleagues who are oppressed by occupation, siege and colonization, the members resolution of June 2019 to endorse the boycott of Israeli academic institutions. We've done so by establishing Brismes campaigns as a legally independent subsidiary company. After overwhelming support for this move at the AGM of June 2020, and a lot of hard work since, I'm very pleased now to announce that the application will actually go in tomorrow. It's a very exciting development. And if you want to get involved with Brisbane's campaigns, then please email me at j.t.chowcraft at lse.ac.uk. Brismes has also broadened its charitable objects to reflect our new transnational reach, our newfound diversity, and a higher degree of public engagement. We've made some crucial progressive changes. We've given students full membership rights, including the right to vote at the AGM. We've eliminated corporate membership. We've created a new category of institutional membership for campaigning and community organizations, organizations just like Masawa, the global movement for equality and justice in the Muslim family that's been co-founded by our esteemed speaker today. We've democratized and rewritten our constitution. We've made the fee scale for the conference more progressive. We've stepped up our advocacy efforts in support of Middle East studies. We've supported colleagues against redundancy at the UEL. We've led a coordinated effort on behalf of dozens of academic associations to propose a new deal for higher education. We've joined with the Bahraini Institute for Human Rights and Democracy to try to end the complicity of the University of Huddersfield with state repression in Bahrain. We've supported colleagues such as Dr. Kylie Moore Gilbert imprisoned in Iran. And our Committee on Academic Freedom has written to the Israeli, Egyptian and Iranian governments protesting abuse. And we've also pushed back against smears, disinformation and censorship, some of it attendant on the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, which has been used in various cases to silence and intimidate Palestinian academics, viewpoints, and histories. So let me say this, for over four decades, in spite of the good work of some individuals, Brismes managed to be either a little lackluster or profoundly alienating for at least three generations of the most sophisticated, critical, diverse, and engaged academics in Middle East studies. At last, this has changed. The tottering state of the old was revealed in a sunburst in the middle of 2019. The old guard resigned, many great new people came to the fore, and since then the society has gone from strength to strength. This has been no mean feat in difficult times, but I'm sure we can safely say that no more Will Brismes members suffer the excruciating pain of neo-Orientalist annual lectures or conference dinner speeches by military men pontificating on the nature of the Arabs, quote unquote, or diplomats exhorting us in essentialist fashion to beware the menace of Islam? I am truly proud to have been able to contribute in some way to the huge collective effort involved in the exciting and progressive changes of the last year at Brismes opening the door to new generations 
and to the energies of critical, progressive, diverse, and engaged colleagues, educators, and organizations. If you would like to know more or to get involved in the promotion of Middle East studies with us, then please go to our website and join us. And I look forward to working together. And it's now my great pleasure to hand over to Nicola for our main, uh, our vice president, who will introduce our esteemed speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, John, uh, for that um, very insightful roundup of what's been happening at Brismas over the last uh, couple of years. So it falls to me um, to have the great honour to introduce our speaker for this evening. So it is truly a great pleasure to welcome all of you this evening to this Brisbane Annual Lecture. And we are honoured that Professor Ziba Mir Husseini accepted our invitation to give this year's lecture. As John said, this is a very important uh, date in the Brisbane calendar. Professor Mir Husseini is an independent academic with an affiliation to the Centre of Islamic and Middle Eastern Law at SOAS. She's a legal anthropologist and activist working in the field of Islamic law women's rights and gender equality with a particular focus on Iran. She is a pioneer of what is often called Islamic feminism, bringing together Islamic and human rights frameworks in order to lay the basis for an egalitarian Muslim family law. In 2015, she received the American Academy of Religions Martin E. Marty Award for the public understanding of religion, she has held numerous research fellowships and visiting professorships, most recently at New York University Law School. She is the author of many articles and books on Islam, feminism, gender, law and legal reforms. Just to mention a few, Marriage on Trial, a study of Islamic family law in 1977, Islam and gender, the religious debate in contemporary Iran in 2000, Islam and Democracy in Iran, Eshkavari and the Quest for Reform, co-authored with Richard Tapper in 2006, Control and Sexuality, the Revival of Zina Laws in Muslim Contexts, co-authored with Vanya Hamzic, um, I hope I said that correctly, in 2010, uh, Men in Charge, Rethinking Authority in Muslim Legal Tradition, co-edited with Mulkia Shalmani, I, who, I think who's here this evening, and Yana Ruminger, in 2014, uh, gen and most recently, Gender and Equality in Muslim Family Law, co-edited with Kari Vogt, Lena Larson, and Christian Mo in 2016. Professor Mir Husseini is one of the rare academics who straddles the academic activist divide. She is a founding member of Masawa, a global movement for equality and justice in Muslim family law. And between 2010 and 2012, she uh, directed a research project for Masawa on the construction of men's authority over women in Muslim family law um, called Kiyama or Wilaya. With the aim of developing a new contextual understanding of these concepts relevant to women's realities and demands for equality and justice in the 21st century. In addition, she has also co-directed two award-winning feature-length documentaries with Kim Longimoto. Uh, in 1998, um, she, she co-directed Divorce Iranian Style, which I, this is when I first came across uh, Professor Mir Husseini because I was a PhD student at the time at Exeter University and uh, Professor Mir Husseini came to Exeter University to show this film at the invitation of Sabo Ismail. And, uh, and I remember, yeah, just how uh, amazing that documentary was. Um, and uh, in 2001, another documentary called Runaway. So the title of Professor Mir Husseini's talk this evening is Recovering Gender Equality in Islam, Conversations with Reformist Thinkers. I'm really excited to listen to this lecture. Um, Professor Mir Husseini will speak for around 35 to 40 minutes. And following this, there will be an opportunity for you, the audience, to pose your questions to her. You can write your questions in the chat box, um, or um, I'm not sure that the raised hand function will be easy to manage in such a large uh, gathering. So it's preferable to, to write your question in the chat box, but if that isn't possible, then 
raise your hand. Anyway, without further ado, I will now hand over to Professor Ziba Mir Husseini. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Nicola, for this generous uh, invitation. And it was so nice to hear John and the new Christmas. I really want to thank Christmas Council for the invitation to deliver the annual lecture this year. And this is actually a strange year, the year of pandemic. And I'm most honored to be able to do that. 40 years ago, when I first started attending the Tehran branches of the post-revolutionary family courts, presided over by Islamic judges, women who came to the court were astonished to learn that their husbands could now not only take another wife, but also divorce them, all without securing their consent. Some were incredulous and would ask more than one judge, can he really divorce me just like this? Is this Islam? Is this what the Sharia says? They used every occasion, sometimes banging on the judge's desk to remind him of the of his role as custodian of the Sharia and of the justice of a system that could not protect them. The judges had no answer. For over two decades, two questions have been at the center of my work. Is it possible to argue for equality between men and women in Sharia-based laws? If so, how and through what processes? I shall talk about my approach to these questions, which has involved conversations with both traditionalists and reformist thinkers, and collaboration with scholars and activists asking the same questions. I'm writing a book constructed from transcriptions of conversations with six Muslim uh, reformist thinkers, three men and three women about this, the spiritual and intellectual trajectories that led to their recent writings, as well as the implications of their work for realizing gender justice in Islamic law and Muslim society. All six are public intellectual whose ideas have influenced my own. With some, I have done collaborative research. With others, I have interacted in academic meetings and workshop. I hope to complete the book before the end of this year. My initial aim in this conversation project was to make the work of these thinkers more accessible to a wider audience, in particular to women's rights activists, as alternative ways of approaching Islam and gender. As the project progressed, I realized the importance of tracing how these scholars came to know Islam and its textual sources in the way that they do. At the same time, I was bringing their knowledge of Islam into conversation with my own intellectual journey. Since 2000, I have been closely involved with a number of feminist scholars and activists and co-founded Musaba, a global movement for equality and justice in Muslim family. So let me begin with a short account of my own trajectory and how I came to develop this methodology of conversation and collaboration as a way of exploring and producing knowledge to challenge patriarchy in Muslim legal tradition. It began with my experiences in post-revolutionary Iran. Newly married and with my doctorate in hand, in 1980, I returned home from Cambridge to Iran, to Tehran, after the, that, and that was after the 1979 revolution. I was hoping to become a university teacher and to live happily with my husband. Neither hope was to be realized. I was disqualified from teaching on ideological grounds and my marriage quickly fell apart for the same reason. 
To free myself from it, I read widely in Islamic family law. I also attended some of the new family courts intrigued to discover how the new regime was implementing Sharia in practice. Sharia is the core of the faith into which I was born, but I now encounter the vision of it that I had not experienced before. Like the women litigants who came to the court, I found it unjust and frightening. Having escaped from my failed marriage in 1984, I returned to Cambridge and started a research project on topic on which I now had some knowledge and personal experience. Between 1985 and 1989, I did field work in family courts in Iran and Morocco. I wanted to know as an anthropologist what it means to be married and divorced under Islamic law a law whose advocates claim to be sacred. Investigating the details of mar marital disputes that came to the court, I focus on the litigants' strategies and how judges came to their decisions. I went beyond the letter of the law to examine the complexity of human relations, how individuals understand and relate to the sacred in the law. During those months of sitting in courts and listening to litigants, observing and conversing with judges, I learned that by the time a marital dispute reached court, whatever was sacred and ethical in the law had evaporated. Neither the judges nor the disputing couple uh, were concerned uh, with the sacred. What was left uh, of the Sharia was a strong patriarchal ethos that privileged men and placed women under male authority. It was an ideology to legitimize unequal and unjust power relations in uh, marriage and society and to curtail women's voices and choices. In fact, many judges in Tehran in whose court I sat always told me you're in the wrong place to learn about Sharia. You must go to seminaries. You must read fair books. And this research led to my first book, Marriage on Trial. And I listened to the judges and I went to Qom Seminary. In the early 1990s, I began to study Islamic juristic texts. I really became interested in fair. Seeking to understand how their ideas of male and female nature and men and women's role in society were constructed. In Iran, I worked with a young cleric who facilitated my entry into the seminaries in Qom, that is the center of Shia religious learning. He also helped me to establish a dialogue with the male clerics in charge of a women's magazine who were just founded, established in 1992, run by uh, clerics, all male clerics, and also funded by the seminaries. And th that conversation was really eye-opening. And through the magazine, I went to meet a number of um, high-ranking ayatollahs. And in the course of my field work in, the, uh, in Qom and my conversation, I came to realize the importance of engaging with the Islamic legal tradition and the need to develop a language and a framework to argue, to argue for justice and equality from within the tradition. I could see how contemporary, contemporary custodians of the Sharia, that is the ulama, modified, reconstructed the gender notions produced by classical jurists. I also spent much time with women's vi women visiting the shrines in Qom. I lived in a house of a middle-ranking cleric and became engaged at how uh, enraged uh, at how badly the shrine custodians treated women. I could see how the street code of gender segregation and hijab worked to marginalize women 
and undermine their experiences. In fact, erasing their experiences. It was also during my research in Qom that I realized that I no longer wanted to be just an observer. I became increasingly aware of the links between ideas, identity, and politics. And I began to observe and reveal in my writing my own motives and changes in perspective in the course of my research. This was the reason for the format of my uh, second book, Islam and Gender, that was published in 1999. The book was based on recorded conversation, following a pattern established in anthropology since 1990s, with the recognition that knowledge, culture, is constructed in the process of conversation. I began with an account of the development, development of my thinking up to that point and described how the material in the book had been collected, as well as my efforts to understand the background and ways of knowing of my uh, interlocutors. And I was really became at that point fascinated how clerics, how the Fogaha came to know what they know as a hukm shari or as a religious mandate. While writing Islam and Gender, I also started working with Kim Longinato, an experienced independent British filmmaker. We co-directed Divorce Iranian Style, an observational documentary that um, many of you uh, might have seen it, in which in that documentary, also in my book, the presence and concerns of the film crew were evident. The film was shot in 1997, premiered in 1998, and during the ensuing years broadcast on TV in several countries, winning prizes in a, a number of festivals. I have written an account of this, which was my first experience in filmmaking, and how it involved me in a long series of negotiations, not only with the Iranian authorities for permission, and access, and with British film producers, TV film, uh, television film producers, but also with myself. I had to deal with personal and ethical and professional dilemmas, as well as with the theoretical and methodological issues of representation. All these experiences gave a new edge to my research, which became more focused on family law, on rulings on divorce, custody, hijab, zena laws. I sought to unveil the theological and rational arguments, as well as the social legal theories that underpin juristic notions of gender, specifically the constructs on which the whole edifice of gender equality, inequality in Muslim legal tradition has been built. My aim was to undermine this edifice, to show that there is nothing sacred about it and that consequently it was open to change. In 2010, Zena Anwar, founder and Malaysian, uh, of the Malaysian NGO Sisters in Islam, which is in fact the first women's group that emerged that both were working within an Islamic framework and also a feminist and human rights framework. Zena invited me to write a paper on the construction of gender in Islamic legal tradition and the strategies for reform, which was published in 2003 for a conference in Malaysia. At the time, my research was focused on the idea of Islamic feminism and writing the paper moved me further over the line towards activism. Trips to conferences and meetings in Malaysia and in Indonesia opened a new world to me where I felt at ease. There was none of the tension between religious and secular feminists that I was used to in the forums of European, uh, Europe and North America, where I had been presenting my work, which was often challenged. 
I now began to speak and write, not just as an academic, merely concerned to analyze and explain, but also as an activist in search of solution. This I found liberating. And in fact, I can say that writing that paper was my passage to proper activism, in crossing the line. It was moreover a welcome change from my experiences with secular minded women's group and NGOs in other Muslim majority countries who tended to shy away from addressing women's issues from within religious framework. For them, religion was um, the problem, the main problem. And they saw my approach and my work as futile and counter productive. At the same time, most Muslim scholars I encountered were suspicious of my approach and my engagement with international human rights and feminism, both of which they saw as alien and Western inspired. I became interesting, con uh, increasingly convinced that until the patriarchal interpretations of the Sharia are until they are challenged from within the tradition, there can be no meaningful and sustainable change in family laws in Muslim context. I saw one of the problems to be the antagonism between secularist and Islamist approaches to the issue of women's rights, partly a legacy of uh, colonial policies. This blocked any fruitful debate and prevented women's groups from forging a viable strategy for Muslim family law reforms. Zaina Anwar, who shared my views, took the initiative to organize a workshop in Istanbul. It was February 2007. And in this, this workshop brought together diverse group of activists and scholars to, uh, from different Muslim countries. The meeting led to the formation of a planning committee charged with the task of setting out the vision, principles, and conceptual framework of Musawa, which means equality in Arabic. A new movement, uh, uh, in fact, we started to, uh, with a meeting, workshop, and then we wanted a conference, but Gradually, we realized that we really are talking about the movement. And we aim to link academics and activists to bring fresh perspective on Islamic uh, teachings. And that was the aim when Musaba started. We began by commissioning a number of concept papers by reformist thinkers, such as Amina Wadud, Khaled uh, Abul Fazl, and Muhammad Khaled Masood. We use these papers to show how the wealth of resources within the Islamic tradition and the Quranic verses on justice, compassion, and equality can support the promotion of human rights and the process of reform towards more egalitarian family law. In the course of two other workshops in Cairo and London, we developed a framework for action in which we integrated Islamic teachings with universal human rights principles, also national constitutional guarantees of equality in uh, Muslim countries and the lived realities of women and men as the basis of our claim for equality. We presented the papers in a book that we called Wanted and uh, the framework for action uh, uh, appeared in that book and also we made it available in uh, five languages. And that began the launch of, uh, with this we launched Musaba in 2009 in uh, Kuala Lumpur. We grounded like, our claim to equality and arguments, arguments for reform simultaneously in Islamic, human right, Islamic and human rights framework. Taking a critical feminist perspective, we work from within the tradition of Islamic legal thought and invoke two of its um, main distinctions, 
That is the distinction between Sharia and Fair. And it is this distinction that underlies the emergence of various schools of Islamic law and within them multiplicity of positions and opinions. Sharia, literally the way, in Muslim belief is God's will as revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. Fair, a literary understanding is the science of Islamic jurisprudence, the process and the methodology for discerning and extracting legal rulings ahkam, from the sacred text of Islam. And we argued that like any other system of jurisprudence, fiqh is human, temporal, and local. And that is also has always been part of the tradition. The second distinction is between two main categories of legal ruling, ibadat and ma'amila. Rulings in the category of ibadat regulate relations between God and the believers, like rulings about prayer, hajj, and other rituals. Here, jurists content mm, the, uh, that there is limited scope for rationalization and explanation has changed since such rulings pertain to the spiritual realm and divine mysteries. This is not the case with uh, Ma'amila, which regulate relations among the human beings and open to rational concentration and social force. And it is in the category of Ma'amila that family law, and in fact, what we can call it law that can be enforced belong. This distinction had given us the language and the conceptual tool to argue for gender equality from within uh, Muslim legal tradition. Contemporary Muslim laws we contend are neither divine nor immutable. They are the product of fiqh as developed by classical jurists in vastly different historical, social, and economic contexts. They belong to the realm of Ma'amilat, an area of fair rulings that is open to uh, ishtahad, reinterpretation in line with the demands of time and place. These rulings we believe and argue must now conform with contemporary notions of justice to which gender equality became inherent in the course of 20th uh, century. And women's concerns and voices were silenced by the time that the fact schools emerged early in Islamic history. Today, we are trying to insert women's voices back into the process of production of religious knowledge and lawmaking. So it was against the background of uh, this background that in September 2009, I began my conversation projects. Two events earlier that year gave me cause for optimism. First was the launch of Musawa in February, and second, the rise of a protest movement in Iran in the aftermath of the disputed June presidential election, in which women and youth were at the forefront. I saw both events as early signs of collective challenge from within patriarchal and despotic uh, understandings of Islam. My first conversation was with Abdullahi Al Naim, the well known Sudanese um, academic teaching at Emory College, Emory University in the state. I was inspired by Al Naim's pioneering work on Islam and human rights. He had something new and constructive to say on areas of tension between Islamic and human rights laws as well as developing strategies for addressing them. In his work, he also addressed the question of women's rights and engaged with activism on the ground, speaking in conferences all over the world, including those organized by groups like Sisters in Islam in Malaysia. In 2007, as the idea of Musawa was taking shape, 
Zena and were um, uh, invited Al Naim to contribute a concept paper on Islam and human rights from a reformist perspective. To our surprise, he responded something to the effect that I am done with this type of approach. I also saw his 2008 book, Islam and Secular State, as a departure from his earlier approach, notably in his 1990 book, Towards Islamic Reformation. One central uh, argument in that book, in Towards Islamic Reformation, was that the secularization will not resolve the problem of human rights in Muslim uh, context, secularization of laws. What is needed is a comprehensive reformation from within Islamic tradition uh, to put forward to put forward a reformist methodology. And the reformist methodology that uh, he was uh, putting forward was inspired by, by the ideas of his mentor teacher, Mahmoud Muhammad Taha, the late Sudanese religious thinker and leader. In his 2008 book, Al Naim made a strong case for the necessity of a secular state as a prerequisite of this reformation. Had he departed from his earlier project of reformation within, and also why he didn't want to contribute a paper when Musawar was taking shape? So these were the questions that I had. And um, I, I just quote from him his response to my question that had he departed from his earlier project of uh, reformation from within, he says, it is not a departure at all. In fact, it is going deeper within the same approach that has two tracks. One is about the internal transformation of Muslim understandings of Sharia and practices of the Sharia. The second track is the external conditions that enable this internal transformation and conversation to take place. In other words, I have first to address the political, legal, constitutional, and human rights dimension, not as an end itself, but as a means to the end. I need the external condition to protect the space that I need in order to be as radical as I care to be in the internal conversations among Muslims about them about Islam, end of quote. As our conversation progressed, our differences in approach and strategy became apparent. They revolved around two issues. One was Al-Naim's rejection of the distinction between Sharia and Fiqh, which he used interchangeably in his work. He did that in 1980s and continued to do uh, after that. For him, it was an intellectual dishonesty, as well as a futile strategy for opening space for debate. The other issue was engagement with the traditional uh, ulama and religious centers of learning, which he saw as futile. Whereas we in Musaba saw the distinction between Sharia and Fiqh as essential for challenging patriarchy from within and engaging with the ulama to be, a white, to be vital to the internal transformation in Muslim understandings of Sharia. Our conversation ended without our resolving our differences in approach, but set the scene for what was to follow. It reinforced my convic conviction of the need for the distinction between Sharia and Fiqh as well as women's participation in the production of knowledge in Islam and engagement with the work of other reformist thinkers. I saw the inclusion of women's voices, their ways of knowing and experiencing Islam and Sharia and their lived realities to be integral to the production of the new religious-based knowledge.
My next two conversations were mm, with the scholars of the Quran, Amina Vadud and Asma Lamrabit. They became, this, this conversation became explorations of possibilities and challenges uh, through shared experience and joint endeavor to find ways to move ahead. This conversation unfolded the, between 2010 and 2014 during the progress of Mosaba's first research project in which all three of us were involved. The project was about rethinking two juristic concepts, Qawama and Velaya, that lie at the basis of gender inequality in Muslim family laws. Qawama denotes a husband's authority over his wife. Velaya denotes the male member's uh, authority uh, to exercise guardianship over female members, especially fathers over daughters when entering into marriage. As constructed by classical jurists and reflected in, call, uh, in current laws, this concept placed women under male guardianship. They were in effect what I called the DNA of patriarchy in Muslim legal tradition. The project resulted in two books, Men in Charge, uh, Rethinking Authority in Muslim Legal uh, Tradition and a collection of, uh, that is a collection of analytical papers critically engaging with the, with the two concepts and redefining them in line with contemporary notions of justice. Another one uh, uh, published in 2017 is Women's Stories, Women's Lives. And this documents the life stories of Muslim women and men in different countries and reveals how they experience, understand, and contest these two concepts in their lived reality. Amina Vadud and Asma Lam Robert both contributed chapters to Men in Charge. And our recorded conversation uh, took place while the project uh, uh, was unfolding and being carried out. I now want to turn to conversation with Amina Vadud. An African-American, Amina Vadud converted to Islam in 1972. Her first book, Women and Quran, published in 1992, was translated into many languages and became a seminal text for Muslim feminists. In 2005, he, crossed, he caused controversy by uh, leading a prayer a mixed prayer, a uh, public prayer in New York. I was interested to know about her con conversion experience and her evolving journey from adherence to a Salafist framework to writing women and, a Co and Quran. Yet, despite all having been the founding member of Sisters in Islam in 1998, for a long time, Amina refused to identify as feminist. Why? And why she began to identify as feminist. That is what she says, I quote. In the 1990s, I struggled with, the, with two discourses led by Muslim women who argued that feminism and Islam are uh, irreconcilable. Uh, irreconcilable. The best way I can describe this time is that feminism was wide enough to embrace Islam, but Islam was not universal enough to embrace feminism. It was a living reality for many people, including myself, who weren't willing to give up one for the other. I just had to take them both. The launch of Musaba in 2009 was really transformative for me. It was there that I began to see the political, social, cultural impact of this gender inclusive analysis of Islam. And I said, well, there it is. That is what Islamic feminism is. And I was comfortable with it. I felt that I was part of a global community. This didn't mean that everybody agreed on, the, uh, on all sets of issues. However, we were all in uh, universal agreement with the fact that there was oppression occurring in the name of Islam and that we did not experience Islam in that way. 
and therefore the imperative to affirm of experience by unifying our forces in order to bring about a much more publicly realized uh, articulation of Islam. By, uh, we did not experience that, uh, Islam in that way. I mean, Abedud me means that we did not see Islam as oppressive, but we saw interpretations and laws in the name of Islam as oppressive. Asma Lamrabet started from the opposite position. A so Moroccan. Got, sorry, just to let you know, you've had 30 minutes. Okay, thank you. I will be done in 10 minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, from the different position. A Moroccan medical um, uh, doctor around 1990, she felt betrayed and disillusioned by secularism and began to study her uh, own faith and to write about it. I came to know her through her uh, book, Quran and Women, an emancipatory reading, which was first published in French in 2009 and uh, received a great deal of attention. And uh, we developed a, a friendship and, and she also joined Mosaba uh, uh, in 2011. In 2011, also, she became the director of the first women's studies centers established in the largest network of ulama in Morocco, that is the Moroccan League of Ulama or Rabita Muhammadiyah, which made her um, a public figure. It was then that um, uh, we started actually becoming more and more engaged to, um, together. She resigned her uh, directorship in March 2018 during the campaign of Women's e uh, Group for Equal Inheritance Laws. And that was because of one of the statements that she made, which became controversial, that the Quran uh, teaches equality in, in inheritance, but not fair. And she resigned. In one of her conversations in 2014, she described the abyss between her approach and that of the ulama in, Ra in Rabite. I quote, when you have a holistic vision of the text and fully grasp its textual and contextual meaning, it is impossible to conclude that there is discrimination. 90% of the Quran refers to ensan, human being, laying the path for proper action or behavior. The ulama study and memorize the Quran. But their knowledge of the text is superficial. All their arguments come from the Hadith and Tafsir. They have locked the Quran in the closet and relying on the exegesis. You are being diverted from using aql or reason against um, uh, uh, engaging with justice. And we uh, are simply guided uh, to, the, uh, to perform the ulama's uh, orders, something uh, that is uh, the political authorities approve. This is my problem inside this institution. My limits are political limits. I am gradually hitting a wall because I ask why there is no justice, why there is discrimination. My other three conversations, and I must now rush, um, were with three scholars who have critically engaged with usul or fiqh, that is legal methodology, and propose strategies for substantive reform uh, of the usul or fiqh. Uh, all of them are well versed in traditional religious and modern uh, education, and uh, they are redefining the conventional relationship between sharia, fiqh, and state law. Khaled Abul Fazl, the Egyptian scholar teaching at UCLA in America, whose critique of modern uh, juries I found enlightening. I first met Khaled in 1999 during a panel discussion, and we kept in touch uh, since. After 9-11, uh, 
now after 9-11 attacks, he became more uh, vocal in his critique of Salafi Islam, which made him the public of the, uh, made him the target of the uh, Muslim extremists uh, in the US, but also um, he, he figured largely on the press. In January 2014, he invited me to his home in Los Angeles and we took for several hours. As he recounted his religious and legal education in Egypt and in the US, two things became clear to me. One was his mother's deep influence on his ethical understanding of Islam and his search for justice. The other was the important role in making his work known uh, that was played by his wife, Grace, who had converted to Islam before they had met. He had just submitted the manuscript uh, of his new book, Reasoning with God, Reclaiming Sharia in Modern World. He spoke passionately about the book in which he developed different elements of his reform methodology in a coherent system. And I just quote from him. He says in speaking in, um, uh, with God, I have developed the notion of ultra text dalil of the divine will, that is reasoning needed outside the text. I argue for an epistemological shift in our approach to Sharia, that it must be understood and approached as a moral dialogue through parables. The Quran is not, a, uh, is not an instruction book. It is a book of wisdom and an infinite engagement in layers of reflective thinking about our moral being and existential situation and from where to where. And I think I won't say more of his approach because his book is well known. Let me return to the last two conversations for the book. They were with Mohsen Kadivar and Sadiq Abbas Mari, Iranian scholars with whom I have been collaborating since about 2010. Both are prominent members of the new trend of reformists taught in post-revolutionary Iran known as new religious thinking and both had to leave Iran in the aftermath of the disputed presidential election in 2009. In October 2017, I engaged Kadivar in a conversation about his decision to abandon his university studies in engineering in 1980 and going to the Qom Seminary to study um, religion. And I, we talked about his time there and how his approach radi radically changed um, two decades later. I quote from him about the change of his approach. I can say that, I quote, around 2000, 2001, I went through a huge transformation in my intellectual orientation. I first began by knocking on every door in classical fare and learned whatever was there. I tried to find my, any opening in support of reforms. For example, take the question of Islam and democracy, which was a hot topic early in Mr. Khatami's presidency. I supported the concept of Islamic democracy that Khatami advocated and even tried to uh, explain its, uh, explicate its basis in Islam. I wrote articles on the topic. However, in the new phase of my intellectual journey, I made it clear in my writings that I no longer defend Islamic democracy. What I defend is that we can have a democratic interpretation of Islam. These are two different positions. Kadivar has pursued his um, project through engagement with fiqh that can open a constructive dialogue between traditional fiqh and modern notions such as human rights and gender equality. And he has developed a reformist methodology called structural ishtihad or ishtihad in principles and foundations that we discussed at length uh, during that uh, interview. 
Let me go to my final conversation, which was with Sadiqa Vasmaki, who is one of the few women to have both seminary training and a doctorate in fiqh from Tehran University. She is also both a renowned poet and a major voice of reform. And also uh, was a member, she was elected to be a member of first uh, Islamic city council in Tehran. And uh, after 2003, when her term finished, she left uh, public office and devoted uh, her time to writing and produced a number of books. And in 2009, uh, in 2011, as a result of the upheavals of 2009 election, she had to leave the country and we stayed abroad first as a visiting professor in Germany and then in Sweden, and finally decided to return to Tehran in July 2017. Our conversation, which took place via Skype in November that year, revolved around her new book, Rereading Sharia, Bazkhani Shariat, which she wanted to complete before returning to Iran. What makes this book compelling is that she uses the usuli jurist, that is the methodology that the jurists use to refute the very basis of their claims. The term usuli, which is derived from usul al fiqh and comprises those who use the methodology when, uh, and it refers to those who use this methodology in inferring uh, religious law, um, laws or hukm shari on the basis of four valid sources in Shia law, the Quran, Hadith, Aql or reason and ijma or consensus. I just quote from her before I go to my conclusion. When uh, I quote, when we read a religious source, our aim is to understand what God's requires from us. Our understanding of the Quran is not absolute, as I discuss in detail in the book. I do not believe that we can say with any certainty what God requires from us today. And this is why I came up with this introductory and uh, with all these introductory arguments to argue that we can at least limit Sharia to the logic, to what logic approves and what does not harm the day-to-day -day lives of individual, that is ibadat and moral contact, um, moral uh, conduct. And basically what she says is that ultimately I argue that we are making a mistake about the Sharia rules and the definition of religion and Sharia. And that this is the jurist uh, definition that Sharia covers every aspect of human rights, uh, life, and uh, understand it as law. And uh, she ends by saying that the biggest mistake is to use religion as a source of law. Let me now summarize my arguments. And in fact, make explicit what remained implicit in my arguments. First, ideas about gender equality and justice in Islam are socially constructed. They are shaped and evolved in interaction with ideological, political, socio socioeconomic forces and people's experiences and expectation. The same goes for interpretations of Islamic sacred texts and the legal rulings that classical jurists have derived from them. Second, the struggle for gender equality is part of a larger struggle for social justice, democracy, and pluralism, which in Muslim context has been enmeshed in an intricate dialectics between religion and politics. In the last two decades of the 20th century, the rise of political Islam and the instrumental use of Sharia as a source of political legitimacy, not only expose the intimate links between theology, law, and politics, but put Sharia at the center of contestation. New forms of scholarship and activism, including Musawa and my interlocutors, have emerged and are beginning to challenge established understanding of the Sharia. 
they start from the premise that the textual sources of Islam are not inherently patriarchal, nor do they set out an exhaustive set of eternal laws. The Quran upholds justice and exhorts Muslim to stand for justice, but it does not define justice. Rather, it indicates the path to follow towards justice, justice, the meaning of which always remains time and context bound. It gives us ethical guidance in princ and principles for the creation of just laws. In 1981, Wilfred, uh, can we go to the next uh, slide, please? Wilfred Cantel Smith published a collection of his essays for which he chose the title on understanding Sharia. One of the essays um, called Islamic Law and Sharia, the Sh Sharia and Shar, originally was published in 1989. In that essay, he provides evidence that for the early Muslim scholars, Sharia was primarily a moral la, rather la, than a legal concept. It did not involve obedience to law, but obedience to God. He showed that the term was hardly used by the early Muslim theologians, while another term, Shar, with the sense of moral imperative had greater currency. Cantwell Smith's essay ends with two conclusions that are both a challenge to, uh, to common understanding of Sharia and an invitation. First, for, a, for early Muslim scholars, law does not define right and wrong. Only God can, and only God does do that. Secondly, the dictum that the central fact of Islam as a religion is the idea of law should be modified in the direction of saying that the central Islamic fact religiously has been the idea of moral responsibility. The law is the result of that responsibility, not its cause. In other words, perhaps the woman I saw banging on the judge's desk in the family courts of early post-revolutionary Tehran had a better understanding of the Sharia than the judge and the system he represented. Thank you.